How is everybody doing? Which is a good reminder, if you would go ahead and turn up the phone. I'll do the same. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> Sounds like the beginning of the audio book. <laughs> yep. Um, everybody seated? Everybody's comfortable? We're actually in person. We like it. Hey. So if you're ready, I'm going to go. How are you ready as well? Are you good to go? Yeah. So hello and uh, welcome to today's discussion. I'm Robert Costa, a national political uh, reporter at the Washington Post on the Inside Herald. Number one on New York Times bestseller list. And as Robert has said that, it looks like it will be number one for the second week. So it's there. Well. Cheers to that. <laughs> I'm Zandia Bayou, Chief. Am I yelling? Or it just feels like I'm yelling. I'm Zandia Bayou, Chief Development Officer here at the World Affairs uh, Council. Hope all of you are doing well, your family is doing well. So be well, stay healthy, and we cannot wait to continue this of seeing you more and being seen as well. So welcome. As a Houston's premier global affairs uh, organization, it is truly my pleasure to welcome you uh, this evening. Might you raise your hands to see for how many of you this is a first time opportunity? That's pretty good. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, I'll do some of the quick, uh, as you know, sometimes just some programming reminders, again, for some of the first timers to see what we are up to. Uh, tomorrow, which is Thursday, the 7th, uh, we're talking about Iran, the heartbeat of Iran with Hara Khan Garlou at the MG Bank Tower, that's tomorrow, so busy week for us. Uh, next Thursday, October 14th, it is our Council's International Citizen of the Year Awards luncheon. Lots of excitement, uh, definitely key business leadership in town as we will celebrate Starley and Al of BP. And with the philanthropist, uh, David Rubenstein, also in person, so we are really excited to have welcome uh, David. Here. He will be in conversation with Vicky, uh, who is the CEO of Oxy. So, very fantastic star lineup, and uh, we are really hopeful that will, yeah, it will be a great event. Um, how many of you are going to be joining us next week? Great. <laughs> how about we make it better? Can I have some more hands? Please, 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 please. It, I have no shame. I'm Chief Development Officer and I've been here for 10 years. Uh, it is our annual fundraiser. It is what makes us possible. It is what makes us possible to give opportunities as it is tonight. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. Next Thursday, uh, luncheon, David Rubenstein, uh, Vicky, other key leaders, uh, global conversation that you are also part of and passionate about. So. Upon exit, I will uh, be collecting a sign-up sheet so, uh, next Thursday. And some of you also know, some of you don't know, that we offer global tours. So we spoke actually, gave you a little bit of update, uh, Robert, about things that we do. Uh, we did operate a trip this year already. Uh, we went to Greece and we came back. TD was actually on our trip. So thank you, Didi, for supporting us. Uh, and that we did have a tour. Next one uh, is uh, the two kingdoms, we go into Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Kingdom of Bahrain. Uh, great interest on that tour. Uh, we are closing the application probably in the next uh, three, four weeks. So if anybody interested, come see me. Uh, would love to have you join us. It'd be a really meaningful educational experience, uh, that's for sure. So many, many other opportunities to participate with council. Uh, all of that is on our website at wachouston.org. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask to introduce uh, our speaker and the moderator, my colleague uh, and Council's Program uh, Coordinator, again, my colleague, Samaria Herbert. If you would join her in welcoming her. Good evening, everyone. My name is Samaria Herbert, and I'm the Programs Coordinator with the World Affairs Council. It's Awesome seeing everyone's beautiful faces this evening. Long overdue for us to all get together. For our introduction tonight, we have Mr. Brandon Ridehouse. He is a professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Houston. 
and he is the co-host of the political podcast, Party Politics. Thank you for agreeing to moderate this discussion. We also have Mr. Robert Costa with us tonight. He is a national political reporter at the Washington Post, where he has worked since 2014. He previously served as a moderator and managing editor of Washington Week on PBS and as a political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree from the University of Cambridge. He is from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Peril is a number one New York Times bestseller and the book is cited in the recent January 6th Congressional Committee subpoenas to the four Trump loyalists, and also broke news to the Eastman memo. We thank everyone for being in attendance tonight and look forward to an insightful conversation between Mr. Roddinghouse and Mr. Costa. Without further ado, Mr. Roddinghouse and Mr. Costa. Thank you. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, well, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm not sure this is on. Okay. Can you, um, somebody have a mic check? <laughs> We're gonna need a extra help. Well, uh, thank you for having us, and um, thank you for um, hosting such uh, an interesting book, um, which is obviously extremely newsworthy. If you haven't read it, there is a lot in here, and uh, it is highly worth your time to read. Um, I found it really interesting because there is um, a kind of graveness to the way that you end the book. And I was taken by exactly how you ended it, which was the two words, and that is peril remains. So I guess I wanted to start there and ask you, what do you mean by peril remains? And um, exactly how grave is the situation that we're currently in in America? Well, it's great to be here. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. OK, great. Uh, and thanks so much for, for all coming out. And it's, it's wonderful to be back in Houston. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, so you're starting with the end of the book <laughs> on a grave topic. <laughs> Great. Okay. But uh, working with Bob Woodward uh, on this book was an intense nine, ten month uh, process. And what we really found in our reporting was that peril does remain. The title of the book comes from a quote in uh, President Biden's January 20th, 2021 inaugural address when he called the transition period a, quote, winter of peril. And that winter of peril, where we saw an insurrection at the Capitol, uh, a really tense transition, that winter of peril has become a spring of peril, a summer of peril, and now a fall of peril. And what we mean by peril is democracy under stress, American democracy being tested. And what we discovered is that so much of what we thought about January 6th, about the Trump final days, at the beginning of our reporting, the conventional wisdom was really only what we knew at the top. And so what Woodward's method is, and it's become my method, and we were a partnership to really try to go back and ask further questions about what really happened. And the peril that we found is that January 6th was a domestic political crisis, but it was also a national security emergency. What happens in the United States does not happen in a vacuum. The world is watching our allies and our adversaries. And we didn't know, and we were stunned when we found out the Chinese wondered if the United States was collapsing. Mm -hmm. Some may wonder if the Chinese were taunting us or they really wondered it. But this was while our reporting had found that the Chinese were very much on edge. And General Milley, the senior officer of the U.S. military, had to calm down General Lee, the head of the People's Liberation Army. He had Russia and Iran on edge about the United States. And Paul Nakasone, the head of the National Security Agency, he's talking to Milley. And Milley says, needles up, which means watch everything in terms of intelligence. Because you never know in this kind of chaotic situation what, what could happen, not only on domestic front, but on the national security and foreign policy front. And what we've seen with democracy itself is that it remains something that's being tested. Bob Woodward and I would often talk about the comparisons to Watergate. When Nixon gets on that helicopter in 1974 and puts his fingers in the air, he goes back to San Clemente, California, and goes into political winter trying to rehabilitate himself and, 
and writing books, like you're writing one about Rick Perry right now, and uh, which we all we, we need to make sure we buy. And I'll come moderate that conversation. <laughs> I'm pretty tough moderator. Though. Okay, well, <laughs> and I'm going to begin with a very grave, grave question. <laughs> but uh, President Trump's out there. I know a lot of people tell me, "Oh, I'm sick of Trump. I don't want to talk about it anymore. We're over it." I say, as a reporter, don't look away. I watch these rallies he's having. He's going to go back to Iowa, the first voting state, in a few days. And what do you see from this former president, who I've covered for over ten years? I've interviewed probably 50 times, is someone who has a warlike cadence, never surrender, never give in. I studied Churchill at Cambridge. I mean, he's, he's stealing Churchill's language, but it's serious. And so as much fun as it was working with Woodward and doing this book, it's a very serious time, and it's bleak material. And the New York Times, I think, really nailed it up this past Sunday. If you read the New York Times editorial page on Sunday, they talked all about this book, and they said... Their main conclusion on the editorial board was everything we thought about January 6th is far darker than previously thought and imagined. Because what we, the real thing we found, and I don't want to go on too long on this, but we thought January 6th at first was about President Trump sitting in his West Wing dining room off the Oval Office and watching the events of the insurrection idly. There's a scene in our book where General Keith Kellogg comes in and says, Mr. President, the Vice President's over at the Capitol, he's okay. And Trump's watching TV and just looks over and goes, all right, yeah, fine. He doesn't show any interest in Pence. Just keeps watching the insurrection, the riot. Not gleeful per se, but based on our reporting, passive. And so that became kind of the, the way the press, at least for, at first, wrote about January 6th, that this was a president watching TV, and this was something that was sporadic of the moment, a march down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol. But what we found in our reporting over nine, 10 months is that that's not the story. The story is an insurrection happened on January 6th, but the real story is what happened in the days prior. The New York Times nailed it again. They called it our book. It, it details a bloodless, political and legal battle, and the President of the United States, the most powerful person in this nation, was anything but passive. In fact, we discovered a 6.2 page memorandum that detailed what many are calling a blueprint for a coup. And this was to send the election to the House of Representatives, not based on evidence, not based on even alternate electors being out in the states, but on the decision of the person at elect term. And if Vice President Pence had gone in a different direction, we were on the brink of a constitutional crisis. Well, I think that too, I mean, there's clearly a braveness to this, as you say, and as the book richly reports, a lot of the story is about the advisors within the White House that try to blunt the impact of the president and some of the activities that they undertake. So I wonder if you think that the kind of patterns that are present in American government, the kind of breaks that are there are enough to prevent something like this from potentially happening again or from getting worse in, in the way that you described. Woodward would, and I would talk about how we had to shatter our, our own conceptions of power. And I would urge you to do the same because we're living in a fluid time in American politics and to almost think about it like a reporter, what we're all witnessing in American politics. And what I mean by that is this, the advisors around President Trump to answer your question, are one layer of power. People in Congress who have official titles, Leader McConnell, Leader McCarthy, people around the president and in the West Wing, like Mark Meadows as Chief of Staff, or till December of 2020, Attorney General Bill Barr. That's one circle of power. And it's almost like if I asked you about your family. There's the immediate family. Now, if I asked you about your who really has an influence in your life, you may venture your spouse, your sister, your brother, and those are all your formal family members. But most people have influencers around them who are confidants, who aren't necessarily the family members. And your own lives have power structures that go beyond the immediate family. And the same goes with Trump. And the, one of the key things that we found for this book, Peril, is that Steve Bannon, the former White House chief strategist, was exiled 
from the Trump White House in 2017, but he doesn't go away. He floats back in to the president's orbit. And I always wondered why Donald Trump, on December 31st, 2020, decided to come home from Mar-a-Lago, his estate in Florida. And, it, and what was so interesting about this decision is at the time, people just thought it was an odd thing Trump did because there's nothing Trump likes more. Maybe that's Trump. <laughs> you know, he's a phone guy. Yeah. If I could get one thing from Trump, he didn't participate in this book. We can get into that later. I would want his phone logs because he's a phone, he's an operator. He doesn't use email. I used to go see Trump at Trump Tower and he would never have a computer. It was all phone, phone, phone. But anyway, back to Bannon. Bannon, we didn't know this at the time, is talking to Trump. And he says to Trump on December 30th, 2020, in a phone call, you need to get Pence off the effing ski slopes. Pence is having a vacation in Vail, Colorado. And Trump says, I agree, I agree. We gotta get him back. And he says, why do we gotta get him back? And Bannon says, everything now is about the six. We gotta make the six a reckoning. We need to kill the Biden presidency in the crib. Now that's the way Steve Bannon talks, but what an image. I mean, what, can you get more visceral than that? Kill a presidency in the crib? And this phone call, the scene was recently detailed in a subpoena document from the House of Representatives, which Bannon and others are prepared to deny. The deadline is tomorrow. Jamie Raskin on the January 6th committee is threatening criminal charges through the DOJ if they don't comply, but they're not complying. But what I'm trying to say here with Bannon is Bannon's talking to Trump on December 30th. And then we find out that on January 5th, the eve of the insurrection, Bannon and Giuliani are at the Willard Hotel, steps from the Trump White House, and they're talking to Trump on the phone right after he tries to pressure Pence to throw the election to the House of Representatives. And so power was being wielded in the final days of the Trump presidency not only by those on the inside with titles, but by Steve Bannon and those on the outside. And ProPublica and other news organizations have done some really good reporting in recent weeks showing that Steve Bannon, more than almost anyone else in the Republican Party right now, is activating people here in Texas and across the country to run for election positions in municipalities, cities, and states with the goal of having Trump allies in election positions for the 2022 and 2024 elections. One of the reasons this election did not get thrown to the House of Representatives by the Republicans and Vice President Pence is because there were not formal alternate slates of electors being recognized by state legislatures. But in 2024, if you have a different set of people in election positions and running state governments, we could have a totally different scenario where the conclusion by the voters is maybe contested in a more fierce way. So when I say peril remain, when we conclude at the end of the book, peril remain, we're not making a partisan judgment. We're making a re repertorial conclusion assessment that democracy would seem to have been brought to the brink in the last year in the United States, but who's to say in two years or four years even more that it could be tested in a way we can't even imagine now if we have a country that's even further divided when it comes to how election results are processed and ultimately certified. The presidency is, is, is always changing, as are the politics around it. So um, I'm curious to know from you, and maybe even through that, from sort of how Woodward interprets this, um, how has the presidency changed under Donald Trump? And we've seen, obviously, big personalities in the presidency. We've seen technological change, even though Trump still uses the phone. <laughs> He's good at Twitter, so there's a kind of tech aspect there to it. But um, the presidency is always a, sort of an evolving institution. So how are the things, how are the ways that you think that Donald Trump changed the presidency in a short four-year period? Well, you're seeing it even now with the Biden presidency. One of the big conclusions we have as reporters in this book is, and I, I would urge you to think about this, how would you assess it? Is the presidency now as an institution too powerful? Because the opening of our book is about Trump and Milley and the transition. But what it's really about is the power of the presidency. Speaker Pelosi is so alarmed that maybe the presidency is too powerful when it comes to being commander in chief of the US military. Our Constitution states that the president is commander-in-chief and has ultimate say over the entire U.S. military. 
And there is a real concern at the highest levels of the United States government that the president is unstable into the final days. And the last time this happened was in 1974 with Nixon. Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger calls around, there's actually a memo the New York Times reported on in 1974, where Schlesinger calls around and effectively says to others in the military, if Nixon calls, and Nixon was drinking at the time, very depressed about the Republicans breaking away from him, he's about to be impeached and likely faces uh, conviction in a Senate trial. If Nixon calls and says anything crazy about the military, fire this missile, do anything with nuclear weapons, call me, call me, make sure something doesn't immediately happen. And this was Schlesinger in 74, famous moment in military, national security, political history for insiders. Schlesinger's trying to, within the bounds of his office, make sure something catastrophic didn't happen because of the whim of a president. But the whim of a president still is, he wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal this week, Bill Perry, about how if a president technically wants to call a colonel in the Pentagon's war room and say fire a nuclear weapon in China now, there's nothing to prevent that from happening. There are procedures in place, but nothing in the law that prevents that from happening. And one of the things that's somewhat rewarding you don't, is about this book is it's prompting a debate about presidential power. Because in the prologue of our book, we show Milley pulling the Schlesinger in a sense, his own version of what James Schlesinger did in 1974. Milley on January 8, 2021, a historic moment. It's almost so jarring of an episode, it hasn't gotten enough attention. You have the head of the US military calling in the Pentagon's war room, the National Military Command Center, which is a series of officers who work 24 seven to make sure the nuclear arsenal is ready in case of an attack, in case there needs to be any kind of strike. He calls them in, and they don't know why they're being called in. And he doesn't mention the president. That's important. Miller's trying to be, based on our reporting, careful to stay within the bounds of his power. And he's walking a little bit of a fine line, but he's trying to just say to them, if anything happens, if you get any call that's strange, call me first. I'm part of this net. I need to be part of the procedure. I'm part of it. Remember that. You got it? And he goes around the room. Yes, sir. You got it? Yes, sir. You got it? Yes, sir. What a scene. Reaffirming procedures that the senior military officer is consulted on nuclear decisions and strike decisions. But again, the law doesn't mandate that. And so to answer your question in a, a, round, a winding way, the presidency has changed because it has enormous power now. And one of the things that our book also shows is that Congress has diminished as an institution. Congress has, when many of you were growing up, whether it was Tip O'Neill and Reagan or LBJ leaning into congressmen and senators with his treatment, they were cutting deals on Capitol Hill, doing major legislation on a bipartisan basis. So much now, whether it was President Bush, President Obama, or President Trump, now President Biden, so much is done by executive order. The executive branch is rapidly expanding almost by the year. And that has significant consequences. In a country where Congress is the people's house, the people's branch, when you have the courts having immense power and an executive branch having immense power, it changes the whole dynamic of the country. And I think when one of the sort of built-in power arrangements is with the vice president. And so you've got this great scene between Vice President Pence and President Trump where Trump's trying to goad him effectively and to do what he wants on the day that the um, uh, votes are to be certified. And Trump says the following to Pence, and, and I quote, you betrayed us, I made you, you were nothing. <laughs> so the political interplay is really interesting, but also the interplay between the vice president and president. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that relationship in specific, but also generally speaking, how is it that the vice president has an emerging role? Like we saw Bush have a pretty powerful vice president in change. We saw Biden have a sizable role for Obama. And now we've seen Pence who served as the brakes that day. So how do you see the evolution of the vice presidency as part of the story of the presidency? I got to know Mike Pence uh, 11 years ago uh, when I was 25 years old. I was starting off as a Capitol Hill reporter and 
Mike Pence was a congressman from Indiana. Mike Pence, who no one really talked to, but I thought he was interesting because he was a former talk radio host. And so there's an area off the speakers, uh, called the speaker's lobby, off the second floor. There's the house chamber on the second floor of the Capitol. And the area where reporters hang out is the speaker's lobby. And ambitious lawmakers will often wander into there to talk to reporters. And Mike Pence would sometimes wander in and no one would ask him questions because he wasn't kind of a hot politician. I mean, he wasn't someone who was really on the move, it seemed. Maybe he was gonna run for governor one day like he did in 2012. But I would come to, I would go up to him because he had a good pulse for what the conservatives in the house wanted. And he would say to me, Bob, good to see you. Do you know what they used to call me in Indiana? And I said, no, Congressman Pence, what did they call you? Call you? He said, I was a talk radio host. I said, I know, I know. He said, they called me Rush Limbaugh. A decaf. <laughs> I said, that's great. That's great. <laughs> uh, do you have a quote, Congressman? And he, he was always kind of look, look at me, and he would really almost seem to be trying to be Ronald Reagan in how he's being communicated. <laughs> and he was a, just a rank-and-file Republican. But I have two words that I've always put above my computer when I write as a reporter. Assume nothing. Because you never know where people are going to go in life. People probably assume things about you. They have no idea what you really have inside. In politics, people assume all the time, Donald Trump can never win, Bernie Sanders will never be a national politician, Mike Pence can never be vice president. Assume nothing. So I would talk to Pence all the time. Then he becomes governor, keep in touch with him, becomes vice president. I cover him all the time. Uh, but he, no one seemed to take him seriously. At times, I would be the only reporter on Air Force Two because the press corps wasn't interested. But he, he ended up being maybe the key story at the end of the Trump presidency. And it was such a fascinating story. I find the Pence story in this book, for Woodward and me, was really a, a compelling thread because it's complicated. Pence is talking to people like Dan Quayle, the former vice president, talking to his lawyer, saying, is there any way I can help Trump? He wants to help Trump. This is not some kind of West Wing episode where he's going to break with the president and walk in and slam his hand on the table and say, I'm not doing this. He wanted to be helpful. And it's easy to understand. He seeks power. Power is, money is important in American politics, but power is, I find, the gasoline for so many people. And Penn sees on his horizon to this day, you may have seen him on the Hannity show on Monday, 2024 is a possibility. Maybe Trump runs, maybe he doesn't. Maybe the circumstances are different, and Pence wants to be in the game. And so with that ambition hovering over him and his relationship with President Trump, he's trying to navigate this whole decision-making process legally, politically, balancing all these different issues. And it's an intense thing, because President Trump's really asking him to go against the kind of values that I saw up close covering him in the House of Representatives that he's a conservative Republican, a constitutional conservative, but he also has made the bargain with Trump to be a Trump Republican. And Pence's experience, we all know about on January 6th, hang Mike Pence, a horrific scene at the Capitol. He's safe, ultimately, but it was a strange, almost violent scene. It was around him, not physically for him, but people wanted to have physical violence against him. But real quick, on January 4th, President Trump's supposed to go to Georgia but Trump says to his advisors, I don't want to get on Marine One until Pence comes here. And Pence's people say, well, we don't have a scheduled meeting. This is January 4th. And they say, we, we, Trump wants to see you in the Oval. Okay, before he goes to Georgia, before he goes to Georgia. So Pence goes over with his top advisors to the Oval Office. He walks in, Trump's there by the Resolute desk. And who else is there? This older California conservative lawyer, John Eastman. And Eastman and Trump start peppering Pence, saying, you gotta do this. There are alternate slates of electors out there. Just delay the certification. Let this whole thing work itself out in the House of Representatives. I can't do it, sir. I can't do it. My lawyers are telling me I can't do it. I would like, love to help. Can't do it. Trump says, you've seen the memo. John Eastman says you can do it. There's a six-point way you can do it. You just delay it, you walk away from the lectern. And President Trump says to Pence, listen to John, listen to John. And the meeting ends, as our book details, with Pence's lawyer, Greg Jacob, agreeing to meet with Eastman the next day. And you then see 
the next day come, and Trump is the ultimate salesman. Now he's, he had the meeting with the group, now he's gonna do the one-on-one, -on -one, close the deal. So he pulls Pence into the Oval Office on the evening of January 5th, a day later. And as you recounted, he says, I made you. But he also does something that is so almost chilling to think about. In 1974, Woodward wrote about this with Bernstein in the book, The Final Days in 1976, Nixon was talking to the pictures on the walls of former presidents. And that was probably one of the biggest scenes in the final days. And when Woodward and I were reporting this, we reported out this scene on January 5th, and he said, Costa, it's just like the final days. And here's why. Trump is told that a mob is gathering, a group, a large group of supporters, very rowdy, out on Pennsylvania Avenue on the night of January 5th. And he says to Pence, as you could almost hear him outside, it's loud. Those people might say you have the power. Wouldn't you want to do it if they said you do, had the power? Mr. President, I can't, I can't. Typical Pence, I can't do it, can't do it. Want to help, can't do it. Mike, wouldn't it be cool if they said you had the power? And they say, Mike, you have the power. What a temptation. The presidency effectively on the table for the vice president, saying you can decide. You can decide an election. And if you read the Eastman memo closely in her book, it spells out, memorialized in writing for history, that they wanted to discard millions of votes with the wave of a hand on January 6, 2021. Pence ultimately says no, but Trump tears into him again and again. And when Pence leaves the Oval Office, one of his longtime friends, our book reports, sees him, and Pence looks as white as a ghost. I think you write it, it's like he left the hospital room of a friend who was sick. And Pence leaves. And then Trump calls Bannon, calls Giuliani over at the Willard Hotel about a block away. And he says for the first time in four years, because Pence did everything he wanted for four years, Trump says to Bannon and Giuliani as they're over there in this war room, he says, Pence was very arrogant. And Bannon and Giuliani are over there, and they say to each other, based on our reporting, that's bad for us. Because if Trump's saying that, that means Pence did not break. But then the pressure even ratchets up more. Jason Miller, Giuliani, Bannon. Trump issues a statement, people forget this, on the night of January 5th, after he meets with Pence, he issues a statement in Pence's name, saying Pence agrees with me fully on the election and will, and will do what I want. Mark Short, the chief of staff of the vice president, calls up Jason Miller, Trump's communications advisor, and says in so many words, what the heck is going on? You can't speak for the vice president. And Miller, in brief, says something to the effect of, he's the president, he can do what he wants. Then the most, the scene that will always stick with me in this book comes an hour later. Trump knows Pence isn't breaking, but he's, he's angry. He's in the Oval Office. Pence is now home at the Naval Observatory, January 5th. And I told you that mob was outside. An aide comes in and tells the president around 8 o'clock at night in the Oval Office, Mr. President, they're outside. They're cheering for you by the second. They're loud, Mr. President. Really? Really? Trump goes over, opens the door of the Oval Office, goes out to the air, exhales and inhales, and says, those people are my people. And he listens to the din, listens to the sirens. And I was on actually the streets of Washington that night reporting. Empty streets throughout the city except around Pennsylvania Avenue. And it was raucous. People fighting with police officers and Make America Great Again hats. Cold, bitter cold night, 31 degrees. Windy. The president says, I want to talk to my press team. 8 o'clock at night. They come in. The door's still open to the outside. They all sit down. The door's still open. Someone says, Mr. President, would you like me to close the door? Leave it open. I want to hear my people. They have courage. So they all are sitting there, a group of advisors sitting there, shivering in an oval office in the United States so he can hear the people outside. And they say, he turns to them and he says, what can we do tonight 
to pressure the lawmakers to come our way. And the thing about this Penn story is that it's not just the Penn story. Our book shows that this Eastman memo is circulated to the most influential conservative legal mind in the Senate, Mike Lee of Utah. In the White House, Mark Meadows and others are saying to Lee, buy into the argument. And so many counterfactuals for history are going to be, what if we had bought in to the idea? It could have prompted Pence maybe to move in a different direction. But that scene of the president with the door open to the freezing air, listening to the mob as he urges his advisors to pressure lawmakers. And that scene was actually referenced in the subpoena for Dan Scavino, Trump's uh, social media director, who was there that night. Uh, one of the people who the president seems to listen to at least sometimes is Lindsey Graham, senator from South Carolina. And you describe this vividly in the book as fundamentally that Senator Graham is like the Trump whisperer. So it's a great scene after the election is done and they're still grousing about it, but they're playing golf with Gary Player, I think, and the president. And um, the reporting is as follows. Basically, you argue, you say here, that Graham was like an addiction counselor, that Trump kept trying to talk about the past, about the election. And he says that basically you say that, that Trump is struggling to, um, or that Graham is struggling to keep his patient from taking one more drink because Trump wanted to sift the past, which I thought was a great, <laughs> elegant way to put the fact that Trump can't get over this. Um, and so I wonder why Lindsey Graham is such a fundamentally important figure in this relationship. Well, and Graham's the McConnell whisperer. I mean, Graham is, he's, he's such a prison into the Republican Party. And he stays close to Trump, he stays close to McConnell. Do you know Mitch McConnell's favorite joke about Trump? It just shows you how the Republicans work with President Trump on one level, transactional, but behind the scenes, some of them, like McConnell, despise him. Uh, McConnell's favorite joke, and he repeats this in the cloakroom, is, uh, yeah, did you ever hear about uh, Rex Tillerson, uh, the Secretary of State, his joke about uh, President Trump? What he said about President Trump, people and the senators will go. No, tell us what did, what did, what happened, Leader McConnell. Well, uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson denied calling President Trump a moron. He called President Trump a moron, but denied it. And people, so why was he able to deny it? I'll tell you why he was able to deny calling Trump a moron is because he called him an effing moron. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they talk behind the scenes. Maybe not with that exact Kentucky draw, but McConnell calls Trump a fading brand, an off-the-track thoroughbred. He's a Kentucky guy. Graham thinks Trump's everything for 2022 and 2024. Graham seems to almost live on the golf cart just so he can play with Trump, trying to rehabilitate Trump. And it's almost like brothers, or it's a strange dynamic. At one point, I know this is a, an elegant craft, and our book is full of the F word, I apologize. <laughs> but we have to report the truth. This is how these people are. And he one time calls up Trump and just goes, Mr. President, you F'd your presidency up. <clears throat> and then Trump hangs up. And then uh, Trump calls back, and Graham goes, I would have hung up on me too. <laughs> and Graham's out there thinking, I need to get this guy back. And think about Graham. He knows the election conspiracy stuff. Was Graham? There's a whole chapter in our book that's very important. Graham proves on his own with his lawyers that all of Giuliani's claims are BS. He tr he investigates it on his own. It's better when so when our reporting shows Republicans showing themselves that what's going on doesn't hold water. I, that's why I, I love being a reporter. It's not for me to say that something's BS. If, to report on others figuring it out on their own, or that it's true. I'm open to hearing about anything about an election or any issue, a different perspective, but our book shows Senator Mike Lee and, and Lindsey Graham, the two top Trump allies in the Senate, both pursued whether there was election fraud, both found nothing. And that's their conclusion, not ours. Uh, before we get to audience questions, I want to ask you a, a question that has been on my mind. It's part of a project I've been working on on political scandals. 
So you report, obviously, part of this is about Joe Biden, and you talk about the Joe Biden um, allegations of people running, uh, or have allegations against Joe Biden, sexual allegations against Joe Biden. Um, Donald Trump has the Access Hollywood tape. You quote Nancy Pelosi as saying that Nixon did far less and the Republicans told him to take a hike. Do you think that political scandals matter anymore in this hyper-polarized world we live in? Wow, Access Hollywood. That was broken by the Washington Post by my colleague David Berthold, who sits next to me. Can you indulge me for a, a Trump story too. for a second? Um, and a, a Houstonian too, by the way. That's right, he's a Houston Astros fan. He <laughs> has that Astros hat on his desk. <laughs> I'll tell him I was here. He'll like it. When everything happened though with the Astros, I taunted him. Now, now I feel bad admitting this to that audience, to this audience, but whatever. Uh, um, the national, I mean, we, we're the Nationals. So anyway, Access Hollywood. If you if you will indulge me, I'll tell you a Trump story real quick. So in uh, September of 2016, I was one of the only reporters for years who covered Trump. Most people thought he was annoying, never going to go anywhere. I thought this guy could be uh, a contender in some ways. And if anything, he liked to talk a lot. And as a reporter, you like people who talk a lot because they share stories. So I, I, I would cover him. And then he becomes the Republican nominee. Woodward and I interview him in March of 2016. And then in September of 2016, I'm on the plane, the only reporter on the plane. And he's the Republican nominee two months before the election. And I say to him, Mr. Trump, are you still a birther? Do you still believe President Obama was not born in the United States? He says, I don't want to answer this. Cut it out, Costa, enough. Ask me a nice question, a nice one. <laughs> I say, Mr. Trump, you're the Republican nominee. Tell me, is Barack Obama an American citizen or not? Stop asking me, I'm not answering that, I'm not answering that. I say, Mr. Trump, you have to answer it. It's an easy question to answer, yes or no. He wouldn't answer. So that became the headline. Donald Trump won't answer whether Obama is a citizen. And you may remember, it became a big news story for a day or two. Trump ultimately has a news conference where he goes up to a microphone and whispers in the most unenthusiastic way possible, Barack Obama was born in the United States. <laughs> no enthusiasm for making the statement. And then kind of walks away. He had all these military veterans around him when he said it. It was a strange moment in the 2016 campaign. And I heard through the grapevine through a couple of Trump advisors, Trump was PO'd at me. Costa with these annoying questions. He's such a pain in the ass. I don't want to talk to him again. And I talked to him for a long time, many years. He said, I'm just done with Costa. Sick of that guy. These birther questions. Ask me nice things. I'm, I'm going to be president. So I said to myself, this is how it is sometimes as a reporter. Sometimes sources fade and you move on. It's not, it's not emotional. It's not personal. It's, it's business. It's professional. A month later, the Access Hollywood tape breaks. And I don't need to go into it. You all know what it is. And that breaks on a Friday. On Saturday morning, I'm working uh, at the Post newsroom, and I'm thinking to myself around 9.30 in the morning, because the whole political world's in meltdown. Is Trump going to drop out? I mean, he, he's saying these terrible things about grabbing women, and the whole world, the Republican Party, was ready to write him off, break it away by him by the second. And I say to myself, I know he's probably angry with me. He doesn't like the Post. But I know Trump a little bit just as a reporter. And I said, I'm going to call him because I bet you he's at home. And with this scandal, maybe Mrs. Trump's not around. And he's home alone at Trump Tower watching TV. So I pull out my cell phone, scroll down to Donald Trump. I call him. And it rings. And he picks up and he goes, what do you want? <laughs> I say, I said, this is my opening here. I said, on the record, Mr. Trump? Yeah, okay. I said, on the record, this is the first time he's spoken since Access Hollywood. I said, are you going to drop out? He goes, what are you talking about? I will never drop out. I will never withdraw. I said, but the Republicans are walking away from you. People think you're going to quit the race. He says, Costa, you don't understand life. 
You don't understand life. I've been through everything. This is nothing. This is nothing. Access Hollywood. Quit the race. Give me a break. And he said, I'm gonna, I love my people, love me. I'm never leaving. I'm going to win. Everything's good. Stop saying this BS. You don't understand anything. And so I write the article. Banner, exclusive. Trump speaks out. Access Hollywood. Quote, will not withdraw. Will not quit. Pledges to stay in rates. Global news. Trump speaks after Access Hollywood. And if you go lower in the story, it says, Trump also said to this reporter, you, quote, don't understand life. <laughs> but that's Trump. He persists. I mean, the norms of political journalism and politics changed with Trump. He barreled through scandal after scandal because he believed that his own brand, his movement, his voters was enough to overwhelm any problems. And so many politicians in history, at the first sign of a major scandal, collapse. I cover a lot of politicians. I'll walk in a room on a tough day for them, and you can just see them sweating, and they're just nervous. A lot of politicians can't handle heat. Sometimes people will come to me, they're thinking about running for Senate or Congress, and I don't give people advice. Well, they'll say, well, what do you think about being in public office? What do you think about me being a senator? I'm gonna run for governor. And some of these people are brilliant, smart, good looking. And you'll say to them, do you really have it? Do you really have it? And I'm not talking about brains. I'm talking about the ability to have the thickest possible skin. Because most people don't. Most people think they can tolerate public life, and they can't. Public life is merciless. And Donald Trump, love him in this room or hate him, that is someone who's lived a public life for the last 40 or 50 years. So he, he's in a diff, everything he does is in the, through the prism of a public life. And that's enabled him to soldier on in political situations that have led others to wither. Um, so there's some audience questions, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll read these. Um, this is a question that's related to that, and that's about the Republican Party and Trump. And the question is, with your book and all the other insiders' books, what will it take to loosen Trump's hold on the Republican Party? And the next line is, anything with two question marks. So concern <laughs> abounds about Trump's hold on the Republican Party. Do you think that it'll change? I try to think about it this in a deeper way than Trump. I first got to know, well, in 2011, you may remember that Sarah Palin was flirting with a presidential bid. Just indulge me for one more story. I think this answers this question. So I go to Pella, Iowa. It's kind of a strange town in Iowa. It's like a Dutch town in Iowa and a beautiful town. And I'm supposed to meet with a filmmaker who is making a movie about Sarah Palin. And so I go in, I'm supposed to meet this filmmaker at a coffee shop. And so I go into this coffee shop in Pella, Iowa. This is 10 years ago, 10 years. I'm 25, 26. And uh, I'm supposed to meet this filmmaker. And it's, it's like three o'clock meeting and it's 3.10, 3.15. And it's just me. And the barista, you know, some kid who looks like my brother with long tattoos, a pot smoker, there's some homeless guy. He's like, no one's there. And so I'm like, where is this filmmaker? So I call up the filmmaker and he say, hey, I'm here at this coffee shop. Where are you? And the homeless man stands up. And he goes, I'm Steve Bannon. Because <laughs> there was this man in like a military fatigue jacket a long beard and long hair, sipping black coffee like, I don't know, it was weird. <laughs> and I will remember this conversation for the rest of my life. I sit down in 2011 with an unknown filmmaker from Los Angeles named Stephen K. Bannon. And I say to him, why are you making this movie about Sarah Palin? It's almost like propaganda. He goes, I'm going to make Sarah Palin the next president of the United States. And I go, okay, she's not even gonna run, please. And Bannon says to me, and I still remember it, he says, you don't understand. The economic collapse of 2008 has radicalized the middle class in this country. They hate you, they hate the establishment, they hate the media, they want something different. Palin's different. The future of this country is populism and nationalism. I said, nationalism, this is 2011. No one was talking about that. 
I said, nationalism? That's like a Charles Lindbergh thing. And what are you talking about? Populism and nationalism, not Republican Party. It's going to be the future of this, this country. The middle class will be radicalized against the elites. And I'm going to make Palin president. Of course, he didn't make Palin president. But the point I'm trying to make to answer your question is, what the reason that came to mind, is so much focus is on Trump, but not enough as to the undercurrents that lifted Trump. Nationalism and populism is coursing not only through the Republican Party, but through the Democratic Party. In 2014, I was on a panel on HBO with an unknown senator from Vermont named Bernie Sanders. I, you can go see this clip to this day. It's a true story. It's on YouTube. I was on a panel for Bill Maher, which I'll be on this Friday, actually, for the first time in a while. Uh, and Bill Maher says to Bernie Sanders in the summer of 2014, Bernie, you can never be president. It's going to be Hillary. You're too old. And I said, I spoke up. I said, Senator Sanders could easily be president. He could be the Democratic nominee. And the crowd's pretty liberal, so they start whooping and hollering. That's right, he could. And Sanders, who I don't know, he's not famous in 2014. He's a kind of a backbench Democratic Socialist from Vermont. He pulls me aside afterwards and says, No, hey, thank you for saying that. I said, I'm really no, happy to say it, Senator. I thought it was kind of an ageist thing to say from Bill Maher, and you could be president. And he says, You really think that? And I said, Yeah, I really do. Said, Why not? Why not you? And so I started covering Sanders. I wrote the first article about Sanders' possible presidential campaign in 2014. People thought I was nuts. What are you paying attention to Bernie for? The old socialist from Vermont. I said, why not? And it was amazing to see him evolve. I went with Bernie Sanders to his first ever trip to Iowa. <laughs> he was in the Drake Diner in Des Moines, Iowa. And you guys now know Bernie Sanders well, but he, he's, you know, I, I mean this respectfully, a curmudgeon of sorts. <laughs> and so he's sitting in this Drake Diner with kind of some older hippie types and everyone's talking and you can clearly tell he's just like not there to be social. And he says, I want to just talk about Medicare for all. And everyone wants to ask him about different things and their ideas. And he was not a comfortable candidate, but now he's one of the major rally holders in the United States. And what I'm trying to say here is Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump both come in part as a reaction to what happens in 2008. I grew up in the late 90s and the early 2000s where everyone was playing Little League baseball, soccer. It was the Bush years. Yes, 9-11 was dark. But ultimately, it was kind of the Clinton economy pumping forward. And in 2008, it all kind of comes to a bit of a stop. And you've seen people maybe in your neighborhood, your family, have moved, some would say radicalized, some would say just drifting to the left or to the Trump right. And it wasn't even the Trump right, it was more to an anti-establishment conservatism or an anti-establishment progressive uh, stance. And that persists more than a decade after the economic a recession, and that's still such a big part of why Trump rose. I, I was with Trump in 2015, in August of 2015, he has his first ever rally on immigration in Phoenix, and I'll always remember this too. I was backstage, and Trump, for the first time, is in Arizona, and he's talking about the wall. Mm -hmm. And Corey Lewandowski, Trump's campaign manager at the time, Hope Hicks are standing next to me, and Trump says the wall. And the crowd was at probably level five. Yeah, we like your Trump, you're fun. You're in the race, you're fun, you're great. And then he says, we're gonna build the wall. And the crowd goes from five to 10. And they roar. And Trump looks over backstage at Lewandowski and Hicks for a split second and kind of gives him a smile and a wink. And then he comes back to the lectern and he goes into the wall again. The crowd roars. The wall again, we're gonna build it even higher. The crowd goes wild. And I saw in real time Donald Trump as a media marketing person have his antenna in the ear, hear the wall as the winning line, seize it, amplify it, seize it, amplify it. Immigration became the issue. And it was probably going to be the issue from the start, but not necessarily. And Trump, again, love him or hate him, he was always adapting in a way. Kept his core uh, positions on immigration and trade, but he would go with where the crowd was. Uh, the, another question from, from the audience um, is on a, a, on a kind of similar train, and 
the question is as follows: Who or what do you think comes after Trump? <laughs> it's the what that I think is disturbing. <laughs> the secondary part of that question is uh, on a related, but different note: When do you think our nation will be moving past Trump? Um, this person also has another question, which is about you. And that question is not intending to be dramatic, but do you feel that with the reporting of this book, has it placed you in any danger? No, I, I don't feel like I'm in any danger. We all have to be careful in every way, in our own ways, but no, I appreciate the thought. But what comes after Trump? I don't like to predict. I, I think that you can't just look at it. When, when I was talking earlier about how I tried to reconsider power, when we think about 2024, it's easy to think about maybe Governor Abbott. I'm just trying to read the room here. <laughs> Senator Cruz. <laughs> and he's a Houston guy. I know, I'm just joking. I used to cover him and his father, Rafael Cruz. We'll do that. We'll do another event on Senator Cruz. You can have me back. The Cruz special. In depth. He's in this book, actually. It's interesting. On January 5th, Trump asked Cruz, I need you to, to object to every state. And Cruz essentially tells him the scenes in our book. He goes, look, Mr. President, we're going to object to a few states. We're going to do our thing for you symbolically, and we're going to ask for a commission to study the vote. But Trump says, that's not enough. I want you to do all states. And Cruz says, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> because there was only so much these people wanted to do. They wanted to be so solid with Trump politically, but they didn't want to start rupturing this to the degree it would be a, a crisis constitutionally. Then again, history will be the judge, not me. Were they playing with fire or not? So what comes after Trump? I would just say, I don't know if it's gonna only be a traditional political figure like Cruz or Abbott or Ron DeSantis of Florida who comes in the Republican Party. Look at Trump, the outsider. On the Democratic side, it could be a, a young progressive who has real media savvy, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the New York Congresswoman. It could be. Uh, on the Republican side, someone who's in the media, maybe a Fox News personality. Who's the most watched person in America on the conservative side? Tucker Carlson. But you guys would have that same noise five years ago when I brought up Trump. Who comes after Biden? <laughs> Who comes after Biden is a great question. Our book is all about how everyone told Joe, I hope people remember this book's half about Biden. He's president now, and I keep trying to emphasize that. Everyone said to Biden, you're too old. It's not your time. You're too centrist. It's true. Everyone, even some of his own advisors. He had run for president in 1988 and 2008, failed miserably. But the Joe Biden who ran in 2008 and 1988 was a man of ambition. If you look back at the cover to him in 88, it was almost like he was trying to be another JFK, kind of a young, good-looking senator. That Joe Biden, who ran in 2020, decided to be a man not of, of, of ambition, though of course he has it, but a man on a mission. Only be, the only mission is to beat Trump. Every time they start getting mired in debates on Medicare for All in the Democratic primary, what does Biden talk about? Trump. Trump. That's the drumbeat. Because he thinks that's what the election's about. And when he says the soul of America, he's really talking about American democracy. That the values, the kind of innate sense of America is under threat. And he ultimately wins. And this is a Democratic Party that's supposedly moving to the left when they elected a centrist president. Yet Biden also has his antenna in the air, and our book shows this. What does he do when he comes in? He doesn't start cutting deals with Mitch McConnell. He looks up at the picture of FDR in the Oval Office and says, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and an economic turmoil. I'm going to go big. Now I'm going to push Joe Manchin. I'm going to push the centrists. I'm not going to push around the progressives. So interesting for history, and it doesn't get enough attention. Joe Biden, the Amtrak riding moderate from Delaware, has for at least now become one of the most ambitious, progressive, potentially transformational presidents. And it was a decision he made to go for 1.9 trillion, to go for 3 trillion now. I mean, this is enormous amount of money, staggering sums, and it's because Biden is pushing it. The centrist. Who comes after Biden? <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I drifted yeah, myself there. I wasn't trying to evade. You're a good reporter. Follow up. <laughs> Who, what, where, when? Who, what, when, where? I would say Senator, uh, uh, Vice President Harris is 
as vice president, someone you have to include in the conversation. Though I wouldn't say she's guaranteed it at this point. She doesn't have a political capital, in my reporter's assessment, to automatically be the successor. You have a lot of ambitious people who ran in 2020 who probably want to run again. I'm paying attention to Harris, Vice President Harris, to Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation. I think he's very ambitious. I think someone, even though she's only in the House of Representatives, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, could be someone who inherits the Bernie Sanders movement. And to me, that's the open question. Biden's brand of politics doesn't work when Trump's not the alternative. So much, I think, may pivot for what's after Biden. Does Trump run again? If Trump runs again, maybe Biden runs again. Or maybe Harris or someone in the Biden mold is seen as the logical successor. But if it's Ron DeSantis as the Republican nominee, maybe the Democrats say, we can really go in a more ardent, progressive direction because it's not just about beating Trump. So a lot of open questions. Some other Democratic stories, I mean, I think it's gonna be a battle for that Bernie wing. Who want the, the party on Capitol Hill is moving left. I think Senator Warren probably doesn't get enough attention right now. And another person who really showed traction in New Hampshire late in the game was Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. So you have a lot of women on the moderate side like Klobuchar, on the progressive side Warren, Ocasio-Cortez, who are building national political brands, working with Biden to an extent, and uh, the Democrats, and many Republicans, I guess, and, but Democrats really would like to see a, a female president. So whether it's Senator Harris or Vice President Harris, I covered her in the Senate, I apologize. I mean, no disrespect. Vice President Harris, Senator Klobuchar, or Representative Ocasio-Cortez, that's uh, who am I. Though maybe you have another person on your radar. I don't have a <laughs> You sound like me. Just like a good reporter. <laughs> So the, I think last question we have time for is this question, which is sort of orthogonal to the question about how Washington is working and how the future will look. This question is about the partisanship that's gripped Washington for 20 years and more so for the past five years. This question asks, given your experience covering Washington, what's your gut feeling on the chances that we'll get back to bipartisanship in Washington, D.C.? I, I, I think we should all step back because there's this nostalgia for Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan, everything was kind of deals, Clinton and Gingrich. Look at what just happened today. Look at the news today. It seems like everything's brinkmanship in Washington, but the brinkmanship has a political purpose because the bases are so active in each of these parties. Both sides need to go to the 11th hour to signal to their bases that they're doing everything possible to fight for the Democrats or to fight for the Republican cause. And that's all about signaling. When Tip O'Neill and Reagan and, and Clinton and Gingrich and others, even in the Bush years, were able to cut deals, it was without social media. One dynamic you can't forget is that now progressives and conservatives on both sides are constantly monitoring on Twitter what these lawmakers are doing. And it really boxes in Congress because they don't have the room almost the darkness to go into a meeting with a Democrat or Republican and start fleshing out a deal. Everything is closely watched. And if you start having a meeting that seems like you're a big deal cutter, you're seen as a betrayer, a betrayer of the cause. So it's all about this fight, 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 and it seems to drag out with brinkmanship to the end. But look at the real news today. At the end of the day, McConnell just said, he doesn't want to have a debt ceiling standoff that ruptures the economy, so he's peddled out some ideas to the Democrats about how to avert uh, a debt ceiling showdown to extend the debt ceiling. So some options are on the table. A deal will come together. The White House did not immediately reject it. The Biden White House said tonight, hey, we're considering it. We don't love it. We hate it, kind of. Making sure we don't, we don't love anything McConnell does. But both sides in Washington have interest in averting a debt ceiling crisis. The, you think McConnell, with the business interests, with the Republican Party, wants to have a market collapse because we're not paying off our debts? And the Democrats don't want that under Biden's watch. So my only point as a reporter is don't always fall for the theater of, oh, this is a crisis, crisis, oh my God. At the end of the day, McConnell and Biden are two of the oldest operators in Washington. They have been cutting deals. I used to see Biden go up to McConnell's office in the early 2010s to cut fiscal deals. These guys know Washington, know power. 
And so they're not going to love cutting deals, and they're not going to brag about cutting deals, but they can cut deals, and it looks like a deal's imminent tonight. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I think we could very easily stay another hour or, or two. Wouldn't you agree that? I'm happy to talk and sign books. Uh, that's exactly to my point. Uh, we do have books if you haven't purchased one. Um, I was actually originally going to ask you to sit there, but I prefer that you actually, if you don't mind sitting here, sure. uh, let people come up here. And of course, again, sure. no shade, there's our logo behind you as well. Uh, so if you are, have a book, come on up. Uh, thank you for your wonderful Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna